everyone. Go ahead and have a seat. Got a beautiful fall morning here today. I love this time of year. I um, want to start off by saying thank you to all the volunteers. I want to thank Michelle, Angie, the ministers, and all of you who helped last week. I thought everything went absolutely fantastic at the Big Block Bash. I know we've been talking about this for probably two months. And I'm just really excited, first and foremost, by how many of you turned out and helped. And everything just really flowed smooth. So thank you to everyone for all that you did. Really appreciate that. So we're going to change things up just a little bit this morning. So Sobeck Song, who is our, our minister, is on vacation this week. So him and Heather and the kids all went out to New York to see uh, Heather's family. So hopefully they're having a great time out there. And so we were talking about, well, who's going to preach this Sunday? And unfortunately for you, you guys drew the short end of the stick, so I'm preaching. But So several months ago, I actually came up here and I read from the book of Ephesians. Because um, as you know, back in Jesus' time and the time after Jesus, um, you know, a lot of the letters in the New Testament were written as letters to specific churches. And you know, Paul would write them. They would be sent by another apostle or by a courier. They would go to a church, and they would read that whole letter in front of everyone. So they didn't have chapters. They didn't have verses. It was just a long letter probably written on a scroll, and that's how they gave the information. And so we're going to do that again this morning. I'm actually going to read to you from the book of James. I'm going to actually start off. We're going to have a little break. We're going to do communion, a couple songs, and then I'm going to finish up. So those of you kids who have a kid's church, just hold tight for a little bit. Hopefully it'll be good for you. But today, as I mentioned, I'm going to read from the book of James. And James was one of the brothers of Jesus. So he became a leader of the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' death and resurrection. And he was res um, respected for the advice that he gained. He was actually considered to be very wise um, amongst the community of believers across the Roman Empire. And at one point, he decided to write down a lot of his wisdom and his teachings so that it could be shared with a lot of the other churches throughout the empire um, and to base, basically became what we know today as the book of James. And this book actually begins like a letter because it was written for other churches. You know, they, he wrote it. It was to be distributed. He photocopied. And, well, I didn't have photocopiers, but, you know, handwritten, distributed out amongst all the churches so that everybody could get this wisdom that James was sharing. So really, it's a collection of short sayings, slightly longer discussions of topics. Um, he has a very much of a conversational style in his writing, short little sayings, interweaving themes throughout the book. Very similar, actually, to what you find in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And like those books, James concentrates on questions of daily living, living in God's creation. So he considers practical issues as concern for the poor, responsible use of wealth, control of the tongue, uh, purity of life, unity in the community of Christ's followers, and patience and endurance. So with that, I'm going to start off reading the book of James. So settled in. And... So James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, 
Who should ask God? Who gives generously to all without finding fault? And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You ever feel that way? Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we, that we might be kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at it himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. Paul mentions uh, there about keeping a tight rein on our tongue. And actually, when we get to chapter 3, he's going to spend a little bit more time with that. But I guess I want you actually to just take a couple minutes here. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves. When's the time you stuck your foot in your mouth? Oh, yeah, that, that's a tough one. A lot of times we don't like to share that, do we? Yeah, because we've all done it. Man, we shouldn't have said that. Maybe we said it out of anger. Maybe we said it out of ignorance. But... What James is trying to say there is we've got to keep a tight rein on your tongue. So just take a couple minutes, talk about that, and then we'll, we'll fire back up.
like to share some uh, pictures from last Sunday afternoon's VBS. Rick Molson built the Tunnel of Thrills <laughs> for all the kids. And uh, they lined up with great excitement to go through that tunnel. and. Uh, We'll go ahead and just show the other slides real quick. This is coming out at the other end. And I was so excited to see the <laughs> joy on their faces to know that they had survived the tunnel. <laughs> and as I thought about these kids, what they mean in the life of our church, I was reminded of a verse of scripture that we usually associate with our stewardship. 
Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Jesus says. And I think he's talking to us about investing in those who are going there. And that certainly includes our kids. And I'm so thankful for the investment of time and energy and finances that went into VBS and that goes into our youth program and into the future of our congregation through what we do with and for our kids. So gracious God, uh, so thankful this morning for the ministry that you have entrusted to us. And uh, we realize the future of our church depends on this next generation. And so we, we thank you for the enthusiasm and uh, the faith of our congregation, our kids, and uh, what you have accomplished and will do through the ministries that we uh, finance here at the church. Thank you for uh, trusting in us, and we give you the praise and the honor through Christ, in whose name we ask it. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, share with you an experience that Lois and I had in August, uh, visiting uh, the eastern end of the Mediterranean and uh, the Greek Isles, Israel, and uh, also uh, Turkey, Ephesus. And uh, this morning I want to talk a bit about our trip across the island of Cyprus. It took me back to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. His first mission with Barnabas was to the island of Cyprus. We read about it uh, in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts and following. Barnabas was a citizen of Cyprus, and so he wanted this new convert to go with him and to evangelize his homeland of the island. They landed at Salamis. They walked across the island to Patmos, 90 miles, preaching all the way uh, until they arrived at the capital Patmos. And there uh, they converted the proconsul, the Roman governor of the island of Cyprus. And so Christianity had a very early start on the island of Cyprus. When we were there, we um, got to visit the home of a very, very wealthy merchant who um, I was amazed to find had dedicated his dwelling, his mansion, to the glory of Christ. And so this shows you, as you look at these pictures, uh, and here he is, the owner of the mansion. This is his view. We'll go to the next one. Just looking out over the Mediterranean and the um, uh, Roman ruins there uh, built during his time. What a view, you know, what a neighborhood. Uh, he uh, lived in and had constructed. Let's go ahead to the next picture. But this is the thing that really attracted me to his palace. He had four baths in that palace. He had warm, and then he had definitely warm bath, then he had a uh, cold bath, but then he had the caldera, <laughs> the super hot volcanic bath, all in this mansion that he had created. But he dedicated his home to Christ. And so here, Jesus, our Lord, died on the cross for us, 30 AD, was buried and rose again for our salvation and eternal life. And in 48 AD, Paul and Barnabas, they took Mark with him, um, were there on the island converting those people to Christ from paganism. And here, this merchant who built his home about 100 AD, 50 years later, um, is dedicating his palace to Jesus. So if you look at the Greek inscription, this is in the doorway of the palace, and this is what it says. Instead of stone, copper, iron, and diamonds, I have used here the marvelous symbols of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he built his house on Jesus. And as you look at the uh, entryway into the palace, you see the symbols there. 
Christian symbols incorporated into the mosaics of his home. This is the effect that Christianity had on the island of Cyprus. Um, and all uh, archaeologists have found 10 symbols. I just want to talk about two of them for a moment this morning. In the middle there, you have the symbol of the partridge. And a partridge is a very caring mother hen. And it reminds us of the words of Jesus uh, when he said, I would have gathered you unto myself like a mother hen gathers her chicks. His invitation to the nation of Israel concerning his messiahship. Uh, the other symbol there is the symbol of the fish. And so we have the symbol of the partridge who can fly high, who is uh, devoted to her family, and who provides security for them. And then you also have the symbol of the fish. So the um, owner of this fabulous mansion was named Eustolius. And um, the fish he chose because the word fish in Greek means, uh, um, for us, Jesus Christos Theos Weos Soter. Those are the letters in the word fish, and it means Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. It's what we call in English grammar a rebus. You take the letters of a word, the word fish, and it stands for something which is for us the confession of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know, and you're probably already aware of this, the symbol of the fish was often made by early Christians. It marked the place where communion was going to be served, where you were safe to be with other uh, believers. And so here is uh, this rich merchant incorporating these beautiful symbols of Christian faith about 100 A.D. into his uh, mansion there on the island of Cyprus at uh, Omidas. He understood this. Uh, he understood that we are delivered, that we are saved, that we are redeemed, that we are healed, that we are justified, that we are sanctified for the pleasure of God. And that's what we can claim for ourselves this morning. We have the symbols here of communion the loaf and the cup. And we are here to acknowledge that wonderful claim that Christ has on our life through his death, burial, and resurrection and to celebrate the meaning of those symbols in our life. And you know, one of the things that this reminds me of, he had all of this when you walked into his house. What do you have <laughs> when people come to your home? How do they know you're a Christian by the way that you live and decorate your home? Something for us to think about as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus, how he came into our world to show us who you are and, and how to live. And he knew we need uh, more than a good example, we need a savior. And so I'm thankful not only uh, for what he taught us and for these symbols that remind us of his ministry and life, but most of all, for his passionate death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He's made the way to you because he's the truth and the life. And I just pray for each of us today, loved ones, family, friends here, guests alike, that through our faith in you, we would have that conviction to say, I know that uh, we are saved and that we are destined for heaven. And so we thank you uh, for giving us that hope for the joy that was set before you to endure the cross, to despise the shame. Now you're seated at the right hand of the Father, and we hope to join you there. In your precious name we pray, amen.
right, kids, if you want to head to Children's Church... Well, I'm sure there were some good stories shared, um, sticking your foot in your mouth, you know, saying things you shouldn't. Yeah, we're all we're all guilty of that. Uh, we'll 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 jump in, jump into that in chapter three of James, where he really talks about our tongue. It can be it can be a good thing, but boy, it can sure be a, a source of evil as well. But before we get started, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful to be here today in this church, to be surrounded by such amazing people, men and women, Christians, people who love you, people who worship worship you. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, I just pray that you will bless the service, the music, the message. Um, Lord, I pray that you'll bless the teachers who are teaching the kids. And Lord, I just pray that all of us may walk away from this service today having gained in your love and in your knowledge. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we'll jump right in to James chapter 2. There's a, there's a lot here, so you know, be ready. So, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, sit on a floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming in the noble name of him whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters? If someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. It is dead. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by the way that, by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Not many of you should become teachers, May f my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We will stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses 
to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a word of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human, can, human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow peace reap a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will become near you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks evil against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go do this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, 
The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord is coming near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought, out of, brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not even by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise it will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the rains gave rain, or the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. So that's James. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? Yeah. Find anything there that resonated with you? I know I did. I just, you know, I've read James many times in the past, but there's, there's so much there, so much that we need to guard ourselves on, you know, guard our tongues, guard our thoughts, don't discriminate. You know, God just wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and, and that's truly what he asks of us. And if we do that, we don't have to worry about any of those negative things there. If we're treating other people the way God wants us to treat others, we're good. So with that, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we had this opportunity to read from the book of James. It's, it's a fantastic book, and I'm so thankful that James took his wisdom, put it down into a letter that we're able to still read here somewhat 2,000 years later. Lord, I just pray for the wisdom. I just pray that some of the words may creep into each and every person here and that in some way it may change our lives. Lord, I pray for this week to come. Lord, I pray for safety on the congregation. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to bless Bartonville Christian Church. In your name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand? We're going to close out with one more song together.
unbreakable. Hallelujah.